Are you all ready for the word of God today? All right. Turn your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. The very prophetic type word today. I'm just warning you. I say that for a couple reasons. One, the week before we went on vacation, um, it was, I think it was Wednesday night. I woke up in the middle of the night at like 3 a.m. and I could not get back to sleep. And this word, this scripture just kept going in my mind over and over. And so I had to grab my phone and write down my notes right there in the middle of the night. And I just typed it and I felt like it was like really the Lord. And then I just fell asleep afterwards. And I woke up in the morning and I was like, oh, I was looking at some of the stuff I was writing and I was like, wow. And uh, so it kind of prophetic because of of that, it's also, I feel like, prophetic because I feel like this is a very specific word today that I feel like somebody needs to hear. And so I pray this morning, as we're looking at the Word of God, if you need clarity today, or you need direction, or you need, you have questions about something, I pray today that you would be able to get some answers. It's also kind of a prophetic word because we're going to be looking at the prophet Elijah. And so we're going to be following the story of prophet Elijah. So if you have 1 Kings 19... We're going to start in verse 11. Would you stand for the reading of of God's word? And I'm going to read a couple verses for context, and then uh, the next three verses will be kind of the meat of what we're going at today. 2 Kings 19, verse 11. And it says this, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go out, stand on the mountain, in the presence of the Lord. The Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came, came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out, and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then the voice said, what are you doing, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king of Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Let's skip a couple verses, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with the twelfth yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. and Elisha, Elisha left his oxen, ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him, went back, and he took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. You may be seated. My sermon title today is Burn What's Behind. Burn What's Behind. Those first couple of verses were just the context today. Those last three verses are really going to be the meat of what we're going to be preaching on today. But I felt like it was important that I didn't just leave you guys high and dry, but I actually give you the context of what we're talking about today. This is an incredibly important moment for Elijah. 
In fact, it's debatably the most important moment for Elijah. He is handing off the mantle to the next generation. He's handing off his, his cloak, his mantle, to the next prophet, which, by the way, Elisha will do twice as many miracles as Elijah. It's a pivotal moment. It's an extremely important moment. And what's crazy about this moment, the weight and the gravity of it, the scripture goes out of our way to tell us God speaks to Elijah in a non-supernatural way. All he speaks to Elisha is just in a gentle whisper. That's all he gets. One of the most important moments for the prophet, and all he gets is a little whisper, just a whisper like that. Go and anoint Elisha. Something I've learned over the years of following God is some of the greatest assignments and callings that you are going to have for God, you are not going to have this mighty, amazing, blinking lights written in the sky, but God is just going to speak to you in a whisper, in a leaning, in an inkling. I love this passage because it goes out of its way to show us that Elijah, the prophet, which by the way, just the chapter before this, there's some epic things that happen for the prophet Elijah, okay? He's on the Mount of Carmel right before this, and there's this famous story called the Battle of the Gods, right? 850 prophets of Baal and Asheroth come to the top of the mountain, and they have this showdown where Elijah builds an altar, they build an altar, Elijah pours water on the altar three times, and God makes his altar burn up and not the other. So you see these supernatural events, and then after that, they're up at, on the Mount of Carmel, and uh, Elijah's up there with Ahab, and Elijah says, with no clouds in the sky, he's like, I hear the sound of rain. And then a cloud starts to appear. And then a cloud, and then it gets bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden there's a storm. And so you get all these mighty moments, and I can keep going back and back, all these supernatural events with Elijah. But the moment that he has to hand off the baton, all he gets is a whisper. That's all he gets. And the passage shows, let's check this out. It says, the Lord said, go out, stand in the presence of the Lord on the mountain. The Lord's going to pass by. It says, a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. No lights in the sky, no amazing things, just the whisper of God. And that's all he has to go on. And this is one thing I've learned about God. That the greatest fates in your life will require the greatest faith. The greatest things that God will call you to will require the greatest faith. Following God is a sowing and reaping process. When we follow him, we have to sow in hope, faith, trust, and we reap his promises. We reap his faith, the kingdom of God. We reap his kingdom. And we sow in. We, this is an amazing opportunity to participate with God. Following Jesus is a sowing and reaping. Giving your life to him is a sowing and reaping. It's by faith we believe and we receive his grace. We sow in faith and we follow him. And so the greatest moments, do not be surprised if the biggest things that you're about to step into, you feel like you really haven't heard God at all. Now you might want more. We all tend to want more. We all want the flashing lights, but don't be surprised if he doesn't give you more. Don't be surprised. I know we all want to just follow him and, and it not require any faith, not require any sacrifice, not, not require anything. But I don't know who pitched that picture of following Jesus, but that's not following Jesus. Following Jesus takes faith. We walk by faith. And it says we go in Romans from faith to faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11. Faith 
is incredibly important to God. And we get to this moment here in the scripture. And all Elisha has to hold on to is just a whisper. Go, anoint Elisha. That's all he has. Do you have a whisper from God? Even just a leaning from him? Even an impression from him? Maybe something he was steering, stirring in your heart during worship? Has God whispered to you in a way about something? Do you need the fire? Or can you walk by faith? Do you need the wind? Or can you worship him and trust him? Do, you, do we walk by earthquakes or do we walk by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? This is what we're walking in. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's never been that way. God is calling us to great faith. And you are invited on a journey of faith with just a whisper. And that's it. Boy, I would love more. I love what Jesus says to Thomas, his disciple, after Jesus rises from the dead, and he's like, let me just check your, your palms here. And Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen and believe. And can I tell you something? Even if God shows himself in a mighty way to you, it's never going to feel like enough. You're just going to want more. I, okay, God, that seemed coincidental. Can, can you do that again? Could you do something like, have you had that conversation with the Lord before? Like, God, if, if that's really you, just do that again. Have this red car drive around right now. Like, it's never enough. It's thing after thing after thing after thing. It'll never feel like enough. And what I love about Elijah here is he's able to take a whisper and take a step of faith and follow God. That's all. He takes a whisper, and then he goes to Elisha, and he trusts the Lord and throws his cloak, his mantle, at Elisha. He says, come on, let's go. Which, by the way, I, I read this story, and I think about Elisha, who was just out in the fields, dirty, young one. It says he's pushing the 12th pair. We don't really know, and he's on the last one, so he's kind of, you know, he's taking care of the, the last thing, the raggedy old Elisha. And I imagine if I was Elijah walking up, and all I had was that whisper, and all the things that Elijah has done up to this point, and I, by faith, have to throw my mantle at this kid and trust. There's a lot of great faith. What I love about this story, too, actually, this entire moment has a lot of great faith, doesn't it? Because you have Elijah's per perspective where he hears the voice of God, and he has to trust him and throw his cloak, but you also have Elisha, who's just minding his own business, right? Just doing the 12th pair, working out in the field. All of a sudden, this prophet comes and says, here you go, boom. And now Elisha has to make a decision too. Like, am I going to follow God by faith here? And both of them, they're, they're completely different. Sometimes in my life, I feel like I can relate to Elijah, where God spoke to me, and I have to make a hard choice. And sometimes I feel like I'm Elisha, where I'm just going on with life, and then an opportunity comes, and God says, go. And what I love about both of them, they are completely different situations, different perspectives, but they're also same in the same essence, because they both require sacrifice, don't they? I mean, Elijah, it takes throwing his cloak. There, here's the thing. For both of them, there is a cost. For Elijah, the cost is his cloak. For Elisha, the cost is his cattle. It costs something. And, and here's the thing. I feel like we've boiled things down, especially when it comes to like following Jesus. Like, there was, like there's not a cost to following Jesus. Like, there's not, like, like following Jesus is just the easiest thing in the world. We made the invitation so palatable that everybody can just kind of like, oh, it's easy. All I have to do is just say a couple things and I can keep living my life. But, but following Jesus actually requires a cost. And there is a cost to following Christ. It's called taking up your cross and following him. It, it, it means I am dying to myself. I love what Luke 17, verse 33 he says, check this out. Jesus says this, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. 
and whoever loses their life will preserve it. You, following Jesus is not about having a backup plan. It's not about figuring everything out. It's about following him. He's a person. It's about trusting him. And it's not about you saving yourself. It's about him saving you. That's why he's called the savior. You're not the savior. He is the savior. I'm not the savior. He is the savior. And so we, when we put our trust in Jesus, we are trusting in him to save. And only he can save. You can't keep your life and give your life to Jesus at the same time. It doesn't work like that. There's a cost to following Jesus. Tap your neighbor say there's a cost. I need you guys to wake up a little bit today, okay? It takes tremendous faith to follow God. And this is God's way. Look at Elisha. Look what it cost him. Verse 21. So Elijah goes, goes back, and it says he left him, he went back, he took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. And he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servants. Elijah had to burn what was behind him. Meaning, listen, in order to step into what God had, he had to say goodbye to what was. It's like this. Where's Sam at? Sam still, Sam's over here. Sam, here, come back here. Come, come back to this store with me. I'm going to give the cameraman a he headache today. You can try to follow me over here. I, I want to kind of draw, yeah, I'm over here. I want to draw this parallel here. Why don't you take it over there? Yes. I want you guys to imagine, did we get the, sweet, that one over there. I want you all to imagine that this door represents the thing that God is calling you to. That it represents the promises he has for you. And I want you guys to imagine that door in the corner where Sam's at represents what was. You following me? This represents the promise. That represents the past. And what we like to do, see, sometimes there is like a spiritual tether that's holding these doors together. And so no matter how I try, Sam, keep that door open. No matter how I try, if that door remains open, I cannot step into what God has for me. I have to burn what's behind. I cannot step into what God has. See, God's job is to provide the door. Your job is sometimes to close the door that was behind you. This is what it means to repent and follow Jesus. You have to go back to that door and say, I don't want this anymore. And when that door shuts, you can walk in to what God has. Now here's the thing. You can't, Sam, open your door a little bit. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Here's what we try to do, though. We try to figure out a way, maybe I can make balance this and make this work. God's calling me to this, but maybe I can kind of sneak in here. But the thing is, if you just open both doors, you can't go through either of them at the same time. You have to completely shut what was. Thank you, Sam. You have to, because in order for you to step in what God has, you have to say goodbye to what was. Now, we have an easy time wrapping our head around that when it comes to sin, right? Like, oh, now that I'm following Jesus, I have to flush my pot down the drain, right? Or uh, now I, I'm following Jesus, I should probably stop you know, uh, going to the club and, and this kind of thing, like to step into what God has. Like you, we can understand this when it comes to sin, but what happens when God is calling you to something new and the door that's behind you isn't even sin? We don't like to talk about that very much here. I want to show you a passage, Isaiah 43. 
You can look on the screens if you want. I love this scripture because God is talking to Israel. Check this out. He says, I am the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator, your king. This is what the Lord said. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew the chariots out and horses, the armies and the reinforcements together, they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. You guys remember that scene in Exodus? God brings it up all the time, by the way. He's like, remember when I separated the waters and you guys walked through and headed towards the promised land and we destroyed the enemy. God is bringing up all these things. And then check this out. The next verse, verse 18. Forget the former things. Okay. I love it because too often I've heard this scripture talking about the old life when it refers to bad things in life. But this scripture is talking about how God worked in an amazing, mighty way. And he's bringing up all the details and he says, forget that. Forget it. What do you mean forget it, God? This is what, I mean, anybody who knows their Bible knows God goes out of his way to tell Israel, stop forgetting what I did, right? Like he, when Israel forgets what he did, they always get in trouble, don't they? It always happens like that. So I was realizing as I was studying this, God is not saying forget what I did, but he's saying forget how I did it. He's not saying forget that I moved, he's saying forget how I moved. Because see, what happens is these past, these past ways that we have make pathways in our mind. And then we get into this mindset of like, God has to work this way. And then we think like, oh, this is how God did things in the past. He must be doing this again. And too often, we associate a process to something that was supposed to be associated to a person. And we start having idolatry for the system that God did instead of who he is. You following me? Jesus is a person to follow. I, I love this story. You know, I was, um, one time I was building um, with these blocks with my oldest daughter, Eliana. And uh, Eliana, she has um, sensory processing, so she gets really overwhelmed sometimes, right? So we were building this tower, and I turn around to get more blocks, and I knock over the tower. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, you know, like, I'm already feeling like she's about to lose her mind, right? And I, I turn around, and she comes. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Eliana. And she comes and grabs my arm, and she says, it's okay, Daddy. And I realized for her in that moment, what was more important is not what we built, but who she built it with. And that's the thing when it comes to following God. When we build things with him, we have to be willing, just as easy as we built it, to deconstruct it. We have to be willing, God, if you want this, it's just yours. I know this took a long time. I know, but God, you can do whatever you want. And too often, we have these amazing Lego structures, and we bow down, and we worship them, and we say, thank you, God, so much. And God is standing over here about to kick it over. He's, it's driving him nuts because Jesus is a person to follow. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. He says, see, I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? We don't perceive it when we're pondering on the things of old. He says, I'm making a way in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland. You know what I love about that? Is before, the miracle was, I'm going to take water and make dry land. And now the miracle is, I'm going to take dry land and make water. Isn't that cool? It's exactly the opposite of how he worked before. And if we hold on too tight to what he did before, we will actually find ourselves opposing God. Opposite of what he's doing. 
against what he's doing. And you think, how could it be against what he was doing? He did it so much in this way because the system was never meant to be our savior. It was never meant to be that spot. God gives and he takes away. He builds and then he deconstructs. And it's our job as kids to say, okay, God, what do you want to build next? And we walk with him. This is what Elisha finds for himself. Let's go back to the story. Verse 21, he says, So Elisha left him. He went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. You must burn what's behind to press on to what's forward, what's next. Leaving behind, pressing on. This is the picture that we have. We walk by faith and follow Jesus. And if we stay too far in the past and hold on too much to what was, we will miss moving forward. And if we miss moving forward, we are going to miss miracles. Because God is still working today. Do you perceive it? Now, here's the thing about the scripture. When I first, I remember when I first read the scripture, and uh, Elisha goes to Elijah and he says, hey, before we go, can I go back and say goodbye and everything? And Elijah says, yeah, go ahead, go back, go say goodbye, right? Which to me was really shocking because when I was reading that the first time, I was thinking about following Jesus, and then I thought about Matthew 8. You remember when, when the guy comes to Jesus and he says, um, Jesus, I'm about to follow you, but can I go bury my, my dad first? And he says, let the dead bury the dead. Go follow me. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. How come Elijah let Elisha go back and you didn't let this poor man go back and bury his father, right? But did you notice what Elisha does when he turns back? He butchers the meat, gives it away, burns the equipment, sells all the things, get ri gets rid of it, and follows Elijah. See, the thing about the man who wanted to go back for his dad, I wonder if what he was saying is, I just want to say goodbye but what Jesus knew is, if you turn around now, you're not coming back. If you turn around now and, and deal with that, you're going to be stuck in that. And this is very important to realize. Be very careful when you go back to shut a door that you don't walk right through it again. Be very careful. So often, we justify these things in our head. Like, I just need to fix some things. If you're able to go, go back and shut the door, do that. But if there is even a hint of you going back and turning back, it's not worth it. I've heard this so much with young adults that I would, uh, I would lead, young adults ministry, before, before the season. I had so many young adults that sobered up and they gave their life to Jesus and they started following him, right? And they're like, now I feel like at this place where I can go back and drink responsibly. I said, just be careful. Because when you open that door again, you know where you were at. Be careful not to walk through it again. That goes with everything in life. Especially when God moved in a way, you start having the nostalgia. You start feeling this. I remember when I used to work here. I remember when I used to worship here. I remember when, I, when God did this amazing thing. Remember, he's doing a new thing. And in order to step into the new thing, sometimes we have to shut the door that's behind. You have to close the door to walk in to what's next. You are finished with that door. It's shut. It's done. Those days are over. That place is over. God's not in it anymore. He's in the gentle whisper, calling you to more. Do you have a whisper today? Is God speaking to you today? Is God calling you to something today? 
Has he been calling you to something for a long time, but you've been holding one door with one hand and one door with the other hand, trying to do this trick, stuck in the same place over and over and over and over again? It's time to let go. Maybe it's time to leave it. It is finished. It's over. I wonder what that's stirring in you. Would you bow your heads? I want to invite the worship team up. When God calls you to safety and security, or away from safety and security, the first thing that we want is safety and security. We want something we can control, but you cannot control a lion. Our God will do what he pleases, but he will be your savior. God, I pray for those who are either stepping into something, they are holding on to something, they're in the middle of something, and somewhere, and the temptation is to touch that door that's behind. God, you have us here for a reason right now. And we choose to trust you because this was never about a place. It was about a person. It was about you. So God, we pray you would lead us to a place in our hearts where we can trust you without borders, without any boundaries, that we can have full surrender for you wherever you're calling. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads one more time, and I just want to have a reflection time. Ask yourself, what is God saying to you in this place? And what is a faithful response to what he's calling you to? Awesome. He's still speaking today, amen? Awesome.